cleaned up first week in May. Chris and I and it's Chuck and a friend of mine named Ron are going to get together at Alice Park on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday mornings. So, uh, let's see what we week. Vinny and I would, you know, I would go out and walk me every morning just in the neighborhood because no matter where we went, we'd be out. Um, but then the weather got kind of crummy and mm-hmm. I didn't have time to. And the metals are super cool. They get up and they move and the atmosphere is very fun. Yes, I can buy you some.
Good morning. It is so good to see all of you and to know that some of you are joining us online. Welcome to Worship with Trinity St. James. I'm Pastor Jamie Glenn Burns. My pronouns are she and her. And we are so glad to have you here on this Revival Sunday. As we remember, as we do each Sunday, that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. We have waited a long time through more than two endless years of pandemic to reach this day in which most of the restrictions have been lifted. And so today, we pray that God will revive us again, revive us as individuals, revive our church, revive our community, revive our world. And you are in for a treat today as this service is based on our theme hymn that Betty will play, and uh, Chris and Betty will, and our song leaders will lead us in. And I've got to say, when Betty Devon and Chris Weiser get together on music, good things happen. So I, I know that we're going to be blessed today. So listen and let the prelude lift your spirits, and then we'll go directly from the prelude into our gathering hymn, Revive us again. All of your hymns for today are on the yellow insert in your bulletin.
<clears throat> Good morning. morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Let every creature and creation rejoice. All, All who know, know the power, power of love cry. cry. Alleluia. Let us share every story of coming alive again and testify to all that there is peace and justice. No spirit of destruction can silence us. Let everything that has breath praise God. And I would invite any children that wish to come on up here and join me in the circle. So I have a question for y'all. Does anybody have any scars on your body? Yeah? Yeah? Did you get hurt sometime? Yeah? Sometimes, do you want to tell us about it? You don't have to. No, okay. You know, I have scars. I have scars on my knees from when I was running across the playground and did a face plant. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't have scars on my knees, but I do have a lot of big, like, brown bruises. Oh, those aren't fun either. Yeah, it's mostly from this, like, doing a skid across a a hallway in school sometimes. Oh. But one of the big ones, it's like the biggest one, is one one I was playing chase or tag with uh, my friends. When I was trying to get to him, there was a big like upward thing. It was like in second grade. And I tripped on it and kind of like skidded like Towards three blocks. Ooh, ouch. Boy, those things hurt a lot, don't they, when they happen? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes some of those injuries bleed. Some of them show up like bruises. Some of them maybe are all red and scraped up. And then slowly what happens? Do the bruises change colors? Yeah. And the the wounds kind of scab over sometimes and then they eventually heal and sometimes they just leave a scar at least i know my knees where i fell on the playground and uh, and uh, one time i got tangled in a barbed wire fence and i can still see the marks but they don't hurt anymore they just help me remember that some of these things are dangerous and they help me remember that Oh yeah, I thought it was awful at the time, but things get better. So I was thinking about scars today because in the Bible story that we're gonna read in a little bit, it tells how one of Jesus' disciples, a guy named Thomas, wanted to touch Jesus' hands and side. He wanted to touch and see the scars. And there can be a lot of reasons, I think, I think Thomas was scared. He wanted to make sure it was really Jesus. He wanted to make sure Jesus was really alive and, and with him. And I find myself asking, I wonder if Thomas also wanted to know that Jesus was better, that those wounds could heal over. And so one of the things I think about with scars is that they help us remember that sometimes we get hurt and like in the case of the barbed wire fence, remembering is kind of a good thing because it helps me remember to stay away from barbed wire fences and be careful. So sometimes, sometimes it's good to remember that a little bit. And also, it's really good to remember that God made us and made our bodies with this amazing ability to heal and get better that Seal it up, but 
or the very haven't to been like hurt or touched, they still have their bones inside. But the cool thing about it is if they can even chop off they can even chop off when like there's a few facts about animals where they can regrow themselves. Like a type of shrimp can like release its big crawl big claw when it needs to and regrow back it. And the salamander when it gets cut off when it one time it gets cut off it regrows. And an octopus. When one of their tentacles uh, get cut off, it can still move. It regrows. Thank yeah. you. Johan, that is that is a wonderful message. All those animals, the the salamanders, the octopuses, the shrimp, if something gets cut off, that healing happens really fast, right? They just regrow. cell in them that uh, connects with others and that can make skin anything to regrow itself and keep going on so it's uh, like it can't die wow well thank you for sharing those wonderful animals and creatures god made and thank you for sharing your own stories about scars i think this is a good time to say thank you to god dear god Thank you for these children and the wisdom they have. Thank you for the many ways that you show us how you can heal by regrowing parts, by healing wounds into scars, by lifting our spirits after we've been discouraged. And thank you for the many ways that you heal us and revive us and restore us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming up, and thank you for helping share this message that was good for all of us today. And you can go ahead and go back to your seats now. Our psalm reading this morning is from Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin, Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again? so that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. As we prepare to bring forward your gifts. Take a moment and recall some of those times in your own life when you experienced new life. Remember, perhaps, a time when you witnessed someone else come alive again. Imagine a world of justice and joy for all. May the gift that we have brought today express both our thanksgiving for the past and our prayers for a better future. And as the gifts are brought forward and laid on the altar before God, let's join and sing our praise in Halle, Halle, Halle. It's um, 226, and we'll sing it through twice. And the words will be on the screen as well.
pray. God, receive our gifts and our thanks. Bless them and use them to revive our lives, our church, and our world. In the name of the risen Christ, amen. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks on his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you will have life in his name. Please join now in singing the hymn of preparation, I Just Came to Praise the Lord. Revive us again. And what a perfect hymn to take the next step in this Easter season. The hymn is a perfect prayer for the day. It's also not the song that I grew up learning as Revive Us Again. The song I knew was not a hymn. It was, Hallelujah, I'm a Bum. And the chorus was not, hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Since I've started it, it was, hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a handout and revive us again. Okay, maybe not quite right for today. And also, 
it reminds me that long ago I read a theologian, I don't remember the name anymore, who said, we are all beggars together. So maybe we are all bums together. Maybe not quite bums, but we all are in need of something. And that something might be bread to nourish our bodies. It might be healing of body or soul. It might be hope. It might just be revival. And even in these days where we are just past Easter, we are focused on the good news of Christ's resurrection, well, we might be a little like the disciples who were huddled up in that room, probably the same upper room where they had gathered on the night before Jesus' death, trying to figure it all out. Sometimes revival doesn't just spring forth instantly. It doesn't happen as fast as those salamanders regrow their limbs. I think that there might be a key for us in thinking about revival from the settings of the gospel story of Jesus' last days and resurrection appearances. Author and church historian Diana Butler Bass helped me understand that I'd never thought of it quite that way. Because she's not in a regular uh, parish, she often gets asked to preach on the Sunday after Easter when a lot of pastors like to take a Sunday off. And so here's the thing. This story from John's Gospel happens every year in churches that use the lectionary assigned scriptures. And so it can be hard to think of, you know, what, what is there new to say about this? And she said, one day I was looking at this and what struck me was the first sentence. It wasn't Thomas's questions. As it put it in the Revised Standard Version, it, said, it gives us the setting, the house where the disciples had met. The disciples had met at this house with the upper room where they gathered around the table for a last meal, a last uh, Passover supper with Jesus. And they went back to that room. And she said they would have been gathered around the table on that night before Jesus died. So what if the story, the sequence begins with the table in the upper room, and then the next scene, we're at the cross. And then the next scene is set at the tomb, sealed up, closed, Jesus buried. And then comes the setting, Easter morning, when the tomb is open, the stone is rolled away. And today's story, likely that took place Jesus' night, is back at the room with the table. And that is where Jesus goes to meet the disciples. Table, cross, closed tomb, empty tomb, table. And I found myself thinking that I can see some parallels between this pattern and what all of us have been through over two plus years of pandemic. When things shut down in March of 2020, we were getting ready for spring fling. We were ready for a celebration of music and art and food, a potluck. We were going to gather around the table with friends, and we were going to rejoice. We were going to enjoy that kind of fellowship. And it might have been an event that was a little like the Passover meal. When I look back at Holy Thursday and I think about how I've been trained as a pastor, I often take a pretty somber approach to that, really recognizing from our perspective here, looking back through all that has happened, this was the night before Jesus died. But the disciples of long ago didn't know that. And 
Passover would have been a celebratory meal, a feast, probably with more than just Jesus and the disciples. They would have gathered to remember how God delivered their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. They might have been filled with high hopes for what Jesus, what God was going to do when they were feeling the oppression, the greed, and power of the Roman Empire. But on this night, as they remembered and shared, it was likely a joyous time to rejoice in God's goodness. A lot like what I was looking forward to at Spring Fling. Then the pandemic hit and everything shut down. Life as we knew it came to an abrupt and terrifying stop. And I know there were some that were, were essential workers that were out, um, out of their homes and serving in some very difficult ways. The rest of us largely holed up in our homes. That's what the cross was for the early disciples. Their leader, their teacher died. They didn't know what to do. And so they ran, hid the empty tomb. We can think about how not only was Jesus closed up in the tomb, but how the disciples were closed up, perhaps huddling behind closed doors, not knowing what was going to happen next. And so we became closed up and imprisoned by this virus. On Sunday morning, the women, maybe some of those essential workers, went to the tomb and found the stone rolled away, and he wasn't there. And yet they were perplexed. They didn't quite know what to make of all this. What they knew is he is not here. And I, I find myself thinking, Precautions for this virus have largely lifted, and yet we know still some places in the world are struggling, some of us because of, of um, conditions that, that put us at higher risk, are still taking some precautions. So it's, it's as though the world is opening up, the tomb has opened up, but we're not quite sure exactly what comes next. Jesus went from the tomb back to the table, back to the room where they had celebrated. And so do we. We went back to the fellowship hall where we had celebrated before pandemic, and last Sunday we had an Easter brunch, and it was filled with life and sharing So Dr. Butler Bass asks, what if the table is the point? What if the table is the way to revival? You all know something about what it's like to gather around the table with loved ones, with friends, with good food. I invite you to think about what it can mean to go back to the table. I have stories of, of three tables, just quick ones. The first table is an old beat up wooden table that sat in the bay window of the first parsonage that Dave and I shared. We moved there fresh out of seminary with no money, no furniture except what we could mooch from our parents or pick up at, at uh, consignment shops or auctions. This table had once been in the kitchen of the farmhouse where I grew up, and it was not beautiful. Talk about scarred. There were some thick spots where glue had dried and we couldn't figure out how to scrape it off. There were marks from paint and crayons from craft projects. There were some gouges where apparently a knife or something had slipped. There were some watermarks. And yet, to set that table with the history, with the memories in our kitchen as we began to make a new life, it reminded me who I was. It reminded me of nourishing meals and lively conversations and life in a family. 
I've always been kind of fascinated by scars. And so this table seemed to be as scarred and imperfect as I was. But it was a table that reminded me I had been through some hard things before. The scars might remain. And that healing is possible because this was, this was a table that served our family well, that we brought our children to, that we shared coffee with neighbors and gathered as a family. When I think of this congregation, I think of tables set out after the flood, handing out cleaning buckets or bottled water or sandwiches. I think about people who have seen devastation before and have come through it, who have been revived. The second table that comes to mind is a picnic table at a little city park in Lima, Ohio. In the fall of 2020, my mother-in-law died. That was before the vaccines were available. And so, as it was for many of you who lost loved ones during this time, we could not have the memorial service that we wanted. We couldn't gather with all the friends and extended family in the church and then have a, a meal, a funeral lunch afterward. After standing outside in the cemetery in the chilly rain, we found it was being hard to just depart from the cemetery and wave goodbye to each other. We needed something more. We couldn't have the typical lunch that we would have expected, the kind of funeral lunch that she, like so many others, many people in this congregation have served over the years couldn't just go. So what we did was pick up Kewpie hamburgers. Um, we don't have Kewpies around here, but they're a thing in Lima, Ohio. And something that mom really liked. And so we took our takeout Kewpie and gathered at these picnic tables at a park shelter. Even in the strange circumstances of the pandemic, a table called us together. A table gathered us. We couldn't quite imagine life without mom, but after telling some stories, sharing our gratitude for her life and for the family that she had raised and nurtured, we found that we were able to go back to our cars, go back to our homes, still somehow strengthened. We maybe weren't fully at revival yet, but we were on the path, and the memories and the hopes that we shared helped us carry on. As I was writing this, I found like, okay, you're a pastor, so the next table you talk about should be the communion table, except that's not what I'm going to talk about. I want to suggest something else. Eight-foot plastic folding tables like those in the fellowship hall. Because these tables, these tables are where kids from the daycare sit every day for snacks and, and in the summertime meals and to do projects. These are the tables around which we gather for dinners and meetings, for flashback, for cookie walks. These are the tables that get hauled out to the front yard to help feed the neighborhood on national night out. These are the tables we use to make a difference in our neighborhoods. These are the tables at which we share love for each other, faith in Jesus, and kindness to those around us. Last Sunday, when we finally gathered for that Easter brunch, it was good. It was good. I could feel a sense of hopefulness and revival beginning to stir up in me. As we return to more gathered events, more shared meals, greater hope for the future, oh yes, we know, the scars are still there. We still bear the marks of all we have been through. We still mourn for those who are no longer with us. 
And we may be a bit like Thomas and desperately want to believe. We want to believe in revival. And we're not quite there yet. We're, we're a little hopeful, but we're not quite rejoicing yet. And that's okay. The story invites us to remember the table. The story invites us to gather once again around the tables, whether it's the communion table, the fellowship hall tables, your dining table, the table where you work puzzles and see that you can actually put pieces back together into a thing of beauty again. Remember the tables where you have known joy, comforted one another, and cared for neighbors. This pandemic has changed the world. It has changed us. The events of Holy Week and Easter morning changed the world and changed the disciples. The disciples went back to the table where they had last gathered and shared a meal and laughter and conversation with their teacher and leader. Jesus went back to meet them there, offering life, offering revival. There are so many, there are so many symbols. And so I do want to call your attention to a churchy table right now, the altar table. And just take a look at it. And as some of you know, this branch has been here before. It's a branch that came from a tree that had been in the churchyard and that was demolished in the derecho. Thanks to Sandy's creativity, it has become a symbol of new life, of revival, of joy. Just last week, the trustees planted new trees to replace those that were lost in the derecho. And so today, we're gathered in this sanctuary. We're gathered before this table filled with the sign of hope and beauty of new life and revival. For God gathers us in memory and in hope to fill us and revive us. From this table, with each benediction, God sends us out the doors of house and church to go make a difference in the world. And as we do so, God will revive us again. Amen. A part of our moving toward revival happens always as we pray for one another, recognizing the joys we have to celebrate and the wounds and the places where healing is still needed. So we'll share the joys publicly, and then when we move to the concerns, we'll invite those of you online to just take a, a quiet moment with God and to offer your own prayers. What joys do you bring that we can celebrate today? Yes. <laughs> yes. So Jess got back in a, in a school this week, and uh, as those of us who work with kids know, nobody sneezed, coughed, or threw up on her. <laughs> And that connection is a joy, absolutely. Allison. Easier this way than repeating it back. Um, my joy is that for the first time in two years, I believe, it's um, I'm back playing with the Cedar Rapids Community Orchestra. And we have a concert next Sunday at 3 o'clock at Kennedy High School. Um, you're all invited. It's no charge to come in. Um, there is a wonderful oboe player who's going to be doing a concerto as a soloist with the orchestra and also a um, vocalist who's singing three pieces. Um, she's phenomenal. Um, I believe that she's the new director, the music director or choir person at Prairie High School. 
So if you guys are looking for something to do next Sunday, 3 o'clock, come on up to Kennedy High School and hear some really great music. Thank you. That is a joy, and, and it expresses in one particular way the joy as things begin to open up and we see revival happening across the community. Butch. at uh, a, a, a dinner, I guess it is, we're all going to be recognized as being volunteers of the year for Taylor and Harrison Elementary School. Mm -hmm. So you know, I believe that the, the actual in, first invitation to that came to Butch, Don Taylor, and he said, it takes all of us. And we are, we are a body. So that's a joy, and that celebrates the good ministry that all of you have done even through pandemic to make a difference in lives of children and staff at Harrison and Cedar River Academy at Taylor Elementary Schools. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we can clap for that. <laughs> yes, Chris. Easter Sunday, and it prevented me from being in worship with you, except online, to be able to have the hand work again, and to be up here playing my guitar with this wonderful woman. It's a joy, truly. It is a joy, and I think we can give a hand to Chris and Betty for... Yes. Yes. Yes, you uh, you are are calling us to the revival that has happened since that flood and and so much was just a mess. I wasn't here then, but thank you for reminding us. I've, I've heard those stories, and it is a joy. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Because it's beautiful now. Well, I, I will invite then those of you who are online to take a moment with God and see what concerns you'd like to offer so that we might pray with you.
Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we take a moment to share our life together, I'd invite you to take note of the calendar that's on the back page of your bulletin. Some of you have seen online that the Johnson Steam Academy is requesting 52-ounce uh, cartons. There's a couple examples on the back table so that their students can complete a project of making birdhouses. So if you've got those kind of cartons, the, you can bring them either next Sunday or drop them in the mission tub on Wednesday mornings. They are needed by May 1st. Also want to let you know that Wednesday, Matthew 25 is opening a new corner grocery store. They've had kind of a soft opening. Maybe some of you have been there. Um, the grand opening celebration is this Wednesday, April 27th from 4 to 7 p.m. It's a really cool little store um, providing healthy food in a neighborhood that's kind of a food desert. So I invite you to, to um, stop by and celebrate with Matthew 25 if you'd like to do that. And of course, we thank you today. This is our monthly noisy offering, or not so noisy because we still have a have trouble getting coins processed, but we do welcome your, your offerings in the offering plate and know that you contributing to, to help provide food here in the city is so important. And that is indeed a way that you are making a difference. So as we prepare to depart this table and go out into the world, let's sing our closing hymn, Go Make a Difference.
now filled with God's reviving spirit and Christ's resurrecting love, go make a difference in the world. What's your issue? I was, you want me to? 